take two. Welcome to my session here at uh, PSU Mac. Uh, it's called It's Log, the one click uh, diagnostic and user feedback collector for very busy sys admins. Um, my name is Brad Chapman. I am a Mac systems engineer at NBC Universal. We have um, a little over 10,000 Macs under management. Uh, we are a Jamf customer, and uh, I've been with NBC uh, for just over four years now. Um, every day is something different. We've always got new and interesting challenges to work on and lots of different business units that we work with and provide support. And some uh, difficult problems that we try to solve in some creative ways. And today I want to share with you a tool that I built that has helped us in our environment. Um, it's called It's Log, and I'm going to show you, describe to you the problems that we had, sort of the, the motivation for why I created this tool, and I'm going to walk you through exactly like every step of how to build it, and then uh, kind of close it out with some uh, remarks about what you can do with it and sort of my own personal thoughts about this uh, project. So um, the problem that we had, uh, which is probably something a lot of IT administrators will have, is that uh, some kind of emergency arises and users are panicking and this, uh, the support uh, team comes to you with some kind of a problem. Everybody's panicking like, oh crud, what's, what's wrong? So, so you'll probably hear something like this. The user has had a very serious crash on their system or repeated crashes and uh, they'll open a ticket, ticket and they'll escalate it urgently through the help desk to desktop support and eventually to engineering. Help desk reaches out to our team and when they describe what's going on, there seems to be some, some bits missing, like something got lost in translation or we, something maybe wasn't understood. So we have to get additional details from the Mac and maybe try to get something from the end user uh, to have them describe the situation to us, but they're not always available. Um, it may or may not be that urgent to them, but if it's a serious crash, it'd be nice to figure out why so that it doesn't happen again. We'll try to collect some logs from the system anyway, cross our fingers, hope that we get what we need, and by the time we get them, critical story details may already be lost, and we end up playing some kind of game uh, that's the new Wes Anderson film, The Life Teleponic, Telephonic with Steve Sizhu. Uh, it's a kind of a frustrating thing, and uh, we'd like to avoid this problem by getting the, the information straight from the user's mouth. Now, I have three uh, incident stories that I wanted to share with you where having the diagnostic logs helps uh, fix the problem or at least help us arrive at an answer more quickly. And we are an Apple Care customer, so we've got Apple Care for Enterprise. We have access to support engineers. Um, for those of you who might not have a support agreement, having these logs act available to you is still something good that you can dive into and try to diagnose yourself. Um, there are other tools out there that you can use to examine them. So we have three examples in the wild of, of problems that we encounter. So here's the first story. The local support team told us that users are getting locks out of their Mac, Macs randomly. Okay, well, that's not much to go on. When we actually got to talk to the user, here's what they said. My screen was black this morning when I turned it on. I could see the mouse, but I couldn't enter my password anywhere, so I restarted. This has been happening every month or so, and my coworkers had this happen to their Mac too. We both have docking stations and external monitors. So there's a couple of things that I keyed off on here. Um, black screen. This is happening to multiple people. It's on a recurring basis, or at least some frequency, and they have a multi-monitor setup. So it could be any one of these things that's causing this. So we got some diagnostic logs from them, and we opened a case with Apple, and they uh, came back with us uh, to us and told us that there was a rare issue with the login window process uh, that interacted with screensavers, and sometimes it would not return to the login window cleanly um, on multi-monitor setup. So we had the case open. This happened in Catalina, and it was eventually resolved in Big Sur doesn't happen anymore. Uh, the second incident was something like this. The support team told us that the edit bays, these are video editing workstations, they're freezing under heavy workloads. How do we uninstall CrowdStrike? Mm-hmm, okay. So um, the answer is no, but let's see if we can figure out why you would want to approach this to the problem from this angle. So when we started talking to the user group and their support person, they said, our, they have a local support person in the production team. They said, our team works on Avid. The connection is dying randomly. I should say this was happening during the pandemic. So they were working remotely. When it comes back, the Mac looks like it had rebooted. They use Adobe applications, no surprise, and something called Pathfinder by CocoTech. Who here has actually heard of Pathfinder or used it? Okay. Fantastic file management application. The, the guy who wrote it has been maintaining this for over 20 years. He wrote it, I think, originally for 
OS 10.1 or something like that. He knows the Mac OS foundation layer like nobody else. And um, they have media on an XSAN volume. Um, it's a storage area network. Sometimes they were seeing high CPU activity from the CrowdStrike process. I think this is what led them to think that CrowdStrike might be to blame here. And the crashes have been happening randomly for over a year. So we got Apple involved, and they, over a period of time, they collected logs and submitted samples, and they came back with that there was an actual issue with XSAN requests crashing macOS. Uh, the issue was resolved in macOS 13.3, and um, they owed the success of resolving this bug to this production team that was willing to get these logs collected and have us open cases for them. So um, that was another instance where it helped. We have a third tale of misery and woe of, of users uh, in dire need and uh, support teams panicking and needing assistance. Uh, this is what we got. We need to roll back to Mojave. ASAP. Okay. When we talk to the user, here's what they actually said. Worldwide licensing had upgraded half of their Macs to Big Sur, but now when we copy files to the file server, they randomly turn into a prohibitory symbol and we can't get into them anymore. Other people on our team can get into these folders at the same time, but we can't, so we end up having to disconnect and reconnect to the file server, and then we have to start our transfers all over again. This didn't happen on Mojave. We need help. So this was kind of a weird one. We even compared this to behavior from a Windows box, and we could see them putting files on the server, so it didn't quite make sense what was happening. And so we dug in a little bit. There wasn't anything clear in the diagnostic logs, but because this was a, a network file server using Samba, we tried collecting logs with another tool that I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Um, it's called Wireshark. And we sent that to Apple, and Apple uh, came back and said that Finder has increased parallel processing starting in Big Sur to increase performance. It was actually starving for Samba credits. I'd never heard of this concept before, but apparently Samba credits are like um, allowances for certain kinds of file operations, and the larger the operation, the more credits it needs. And with all the parallel processing going on, it was like starving for credits all the time, and Finder was locking up. And then it would do things like randomly say the file has, you can't access this file. The standard for Windows Server was uh, 256 credits. So we recommended that the storage team increase the Samba credit limit on the NetApp server to 256. Um, there was a diminishing margin of returns as we raised it higher than that. 512 was also fine. So that was kind of an odd issue, but it was helpful that we at least had the diagnostic logs from the Mac, but also Wireshark, which is an incredibly powerful network analysis tool. It includes hundreds of protocols, including Samba, TCP IP. Uh, you can examine Wi-Fi packets, you know, negotiations of all different kinds and trace conversations. Um, it's Linux, Mac, and Windows, available on all three major operating systems. It's free and open source, and um, it really helped us figure out what was wrong because we could see the Samba conversations in there. So um, the solution to this problem of, of getting logs faster from these users and also trying to uh, get their stories is what we're going to talk about today. Presenting, it's log. All admins love logs. It's better than bash. It's good. Each sold separately, use only as directed, batteries not included, not responsible for back injuries. So uh, here's a little preview of what it's log does. So when uh, the user has a problem, they launch the it's log utility and they write a brief description of what happened to their Mac. Um, the, you know, for instance, they had a crash in Premiere. Then we require them to enter their employee ID and make a few selections of like what kind of issue, how frequently did it occur, and when was the last time it occurred. Um, if you've used Feedback Assistant before, this is probably somewhat familiar. That was the intended goal here, was to create a miniature version of that. Um, it has been gathering and compressing the logs in the background the whole time, and it will upload them um, when that's completed. The user can com uh, dismiss the survey, it compresses these logs and then uploads them to uh, an S3 bucket. And uh, then it shows them the progress of the files as they're being uploaded. Um, the average size of a file is a few hundred megabytes, so you know, it may take a few minutes. And this is good for users that might be on a remote or slow connection to, to get those files uh, uploaded. So when it's all done, uh, it tells the user that it was successful and it closes the window. So its log was designed for end users. It collects diagnostic logs in the background, and it will request additional information uh, about the incident. It uploads the system logs to cloud storage. In this case, we're going to use Amazon. 
and it sends you a notification when it's done. It contains, uh, the, the notification contains the responses that the user entered and a link to download the log file. And it's intended for serious crashes and reproducible bugs. So try to set some reasonable expectations with your end users to not invoke this tool every time they have a little issue. This is for major stuff only. Uh, now, what is the secret sauce behind this tool? Uh, it's, it's the sysdiagnose file, which if you've worked with Apple before uh, or Apple Care, they may ask you for these logs. If you've opened a feedback ticket before, your uh, feedback assistant is automatically collecting these in the background. So what is a sysdiagnose? It's a compressed archive. It contains a log from most Mac services, and it includes a real-time performance snapshot as well as uh, historical power and performance data. Uh, and a copy of the Mac OS Unified Log Archive. That's probably the largest chunk. And then a copy of your system profiler report, and a whole lot more. The sysdiagnose contains hundreds of files and folders. Uh, and here's just like sort of a rundown of, of every little thing that I could find, and I've highlighted the folders in, in white. Um, it's a lot more information than you probably will need for most troubleshooting issues. Um, when you upload these to Apple, they actually have a thing on the back end that rips these apart, looks for crashes and, and errors, and, and will try to start the analysis for the Apple Care team. Um, and so that, that helps um, get your, uh, a response back from Apple when you're working with them. A lot of times when you are working with Apple, they'll ask you for more information. And so you can generate the sysdiagnose files in a number of ways. There's a keyboard combo, control, shift, option, command, period. And when you do that, the screen will flash briefly. And then uh, you can also run the sysdiagnose command from terminal. Uh, it generates the file for a few minutes, and then it'll show it to you in Finder. You can also generate these via Feedback Assistant, although those go straight to Apple. So you can't really, you'd have to wait for them to upload and then download them again. It's not really um, useful for this. If you're working with Apple Care, they have a tool called the Enterprise Data Collector. It's not used very much anymore, but it was something that could collect the sysdiagnose and send it to Apple. The critical information that we need from the user are the five W's of journalism. Who, what, when, where, and why. Who is, uh, we want to know information about the affected Mac and the user. What, we want to know what happened, describe the crash or the incident. When, we need to know the timestamp, the frequency, and is this a repeatable event. Where, this is the range of affected users of devices. Is it one person, is it five people, is it a whole department, and why. Please tell us the impact that this is having. We need the story about how this is affecting your work. So. We've got a big file. We have a bigger problem. How do we get this 400 or 500 megabyte file to the admin? And how does an end user transmit this reliably? Do they even have access to uh, cloud storage large enough to, to you know, upload this file? Do they even know how? Are they thinking clearly enough to do it? Do you want to try to walk them through this over the phone? Probably not. Um, and more importantly, we need to know from the user like, what this means to them and how it's impacting them. Uh, and then, most importantly, what they were doing just before the crash. So uh, we're going to, I'm going to show you slides and then alternate and jump into the Amazon console and show you each piece as we, as we go through it. So like three or four slides, jump to Amazon, and then come back. All right. So uh, the components that we're going to be setting up for its log, you will need an email account. You will be setting up Amazon Simple Notification Service, or SNS. You will need an S3 bucket to receive the files. We will be building one Lambda function. We will be crafting an IAM policy, uh, identity and access management, and creating an IAM user and an access key, a secret key combo. And then we'll need some resources. Uh, in this case, we're going to be using Swift Dialog and then uh, the actual script itself. So the flow of uh, its log is like this. You deploy the tool. The user runs it. It uh, sends the stuff to, uh, it connects to Amazon, and it verifies that you have the rights to put it in the S3 bucket. And then once it's in the bucket, it triggers a Lambda function, which then sends the message to SNS, and then finally it arrives in your inbox. Now, just so you know, SNS could be used for other services like webhooks, if you have a Slack or Teams or something. But email is the simplest, because we all have one. Um, so I'm not going to show you how to set up an email account. <laughs> you can figure that out on your own. Um, any email address is fine. You have to confirm the subscription the first time you set it up in SNS. Uh, you want to add the sns.amazonaws.com domain to your uh, senders list. 
Um, I would also recommend that you check the, um, uh, the spam folder and look at the other side of your Outlook inbox, because uh, when I first set this up, I was like, where are my messages? And they ended up in other instead of focused. So um, SNS is a publish and subscribe messaging service. So messages are published to topics, and then you subscribe to a topic to receive the notification event. Um, the topic can't be renamed once it's created, but you can just destroy it and, and set it up again. Some services in Amazon are region specific, like the bucket, uh, the Lambda functions, SNS, to name a few. Um, so when you are deciding on where do you want to implement its log in Amazon, pick the bucket that's closest to you geographically, but also consider the cost, because buckets have diff uh, different prices and, and Amazon charges differently based on the region. Um, if you have customers all over the world, you may just have to use one bucket and sort of pick geographically where the best one is. Um, so then SNS, we're going to create a st uh, standard delivery. Uh, you can call it whatever you like and add a description. The email uh, is going to, the, the description is going to be the sender or the from name in the email. Um, we don't need encryption. The access policy is basic. Um, and these are all default settings that I'm going to show you. We will create the topic. And then um, we will create the subscription. Sorry. And then we're going to enter the ARN, or the Amazon resource name, from the topic. It'll auto-populate when you do that. You select protocol as email, enter your email address, create the subscription, and then go check your inbox. Look in spam and other. Set up some mail rules if you want. You do need to confirm the subscription. So now let's go do that. I'll show you where that is. So I'll pull this over. The Amazon console. Can you all see that clearly? All right, cool. So uh, I have here at the top of the Amazon console uh, the toolbar of, of services that I've already starred. So if I were to search for SNS, for instance, you can actually put a star here, and that will uh, sticky it to the toolbar. So go to SNS. And I've already created a topic, but I'll just walk you through the steps so you can see this. So create the topic, standard delivery. Here's the name. We're going to you know, call this like its log uh, SNS survey sender. Top, my topic would be, if this is, again, what's going to look like, what it's going to say in your inbox. So its log surveys. And then you don't need to configure any of these other options here. The access policy, as I mentioned, is basic. Um, data protection policy, again, these are low sensitivity messages. You're just trying to get these through. You create the topic. There it is. And then we're going to go to SNS, go to uh, subscriptions, create the subscription, select your topic that we just created. The protocol is email. The endpoint is your email address, and then create the subscription. So I'm not going to do that part because I've already confirmed an email address. I just wanted to show you, it's like sort of walking through that, what that looks like. I'm going to go ahead and delete that. Delete me. That's what happens when you type in front of an audience. All right, so then um, the next thing we do is we set up the S3 bucket. S3 buckets must have a globally unique name. Why? Because it's always DNS. These names exist. Amazon is a DNS resolver, so they are available within minutes of creating them. But you do have to pick a unique one that isn't used anywhere else. Um, again, choose the region. You have to consider the cost for that. Uh, ownership on the bucket is ACL is disabled. That is a default option. And as of April 23, Amazon recommends and has turned all buckets private. So unless you have a really good reason to make them public, you should keep this private. This tool works with uh, private access. It's fine. Um, there is no need to put versions or tags or anything. Um, version control is when you're updating the same file and you want to keep track of it. These are unique files every single time, so we don't need version control. Default encryption, create the bucket. Then we're going to create, actually, let's go do that right now. So we're going to go to S3, and then we will create the bucket. Right, so you call it its log S3 bucket 001, pick a region. Object ownership is ACL is disabled. Public access is blocked. Versioning is disabled, tags are disabled. Default encryption, nothing else, and create the bucket. Okay, so that's that part. 
then life cycle rules. So Amazon charges you for data that you upload, data that you download, and data that you store. So if you don't need to keep these files in the bucket forever, and really you shouldn't, you'll want to delete them with a life cycle rule. Um, Sysdiagnose logs generally have a lifespan of a, I mean, they're useful only for about a week, and if, any, if it goes longer than that, you probably want to grab a fresh one anyway. So I recommend setting a life cycle rule to delete these after seven days. We want to limit the scope using a filter to the, um, the folder or prefix that we collect. And I'm sorry, the screenshot's wrong. We only need its log slash star. That will, that will delete anything in the bucket after seven days. Um, you should note that, it, that there will be folders or prefixes inside your bucket after using this for a while. It's OK if the lifecycle rule deletes these because they automatically get recreated and populated all the way down to the file level every time you use it. So uh, you, you, know, you can bury something five levels deep, and it'll create all the nested folders for you. Um, then the actions to apply would be to expire the current version of the file and then delete the non-current file. Expire them after seven days and then delete them one day later. So before we get to the Lambda function, we'll show that real quick. So we go into the bucket here that we just created and we go to management. No lifecycle rule, we'll create that. We're going to do its log, delete after seven days like the ring. Limit scope, we're going to enter the prefix of its log slash star, and then no tags, no minimum size, and then the actions are expire current versions and permanently delete them after. We're going to expire them after seven days and then permanently delete them one day later. And then that is the rule. So you can see it shows you here is what's going to happen. After day seven, objects expire. After non-current or expired objects do that, a day later they're deleted. So create the rule. All right, so don't need that. All right, because we have a bucket already. All right, so back into this. Now, the Lambda function. This is where the exciting stuff happens, because Lambda is serverless microcode. It's like a little containerized application running on a Unix server. Um, the Lambda editor has a basic code repository organizer for uh, managing uh, multiple scripts in your, in your Lambda functions. For this purpose, the S3 events are sent over as raw JSON, and Lambda is, is quite capable of processing these. Um, you can write uh, functions in Python or node.js. Um, the Lambda function that we're adding is going to process a text file, and then is going to send us an email using the SNS API within the function. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why we need to do that, because Lambda functions can have uh, something that calls them, which is a trigger, and then you can have an output of a Lambda function, like SNS or SQS or something else. We're going to do this inside the function because um, it's the only way to customize the email subject and the body of the message. If you just send the output to uh, the, the destination of SNS, it's going to be kind of raw and ugly. We want something that's like formatted and, and looks nice and is accessible. Um, you want to make sure you create all of these things in the same region as your bucket. Because when you're navigating the console, if you click Lambda and you're not in the same region, you're like, where did my function go? Where did my, you know, you can't find it. And it's just because you have to go to the top right corner, switch down to the region, make sure everything's all lined up. Um, so the function that we're building is uh, for reading the survey files. Its log uploads two things. It uploads the diagnostic file, and then it uploads the, uh, the text file with the survey responses. The survey file also contains the um, references to uh, the data that we need, but it's, it's going to take that, find the log that we uploaded, and then generate a signed URL for us. We're going to author a function from scratch, call it whatever we like. The runtime is Node.js 16. Some of you who use Amazon all the time will note that is not current. Um, that is because Node.js 18 requires the, S, or the version 3 SDK. Um, this uh, one uses version 2. It's still fully supported, at least for a couple of years. Um, and I didn't want to try to rewrite everything in uh, S3 or in uh, version 3. That said, um, version 3 is designed to use a lot less memory. For this, you're probably not going to fire this function very often, so it's not going to cost a lot to run it. Um, for context, I've been using this pretty heavily, and I think my highest bill was a dollar. So it isn't, doesn't cost a lot to run. Um, the permissions on the Lambda function, you will be changing the default execution role and creating roles from an AWS policy template. And the template is going to have two things in it. Read-only access to S3, 
and publication to SNS. That's all the permission this thing needs. And then Lambda will generate the, func the execution roles for you. And that takes about 30 seconds. Let's go that far. So let's go back to the console in Lambda. And we're going to create a function from scratch. You can call it its log lambda read survey node.js 16 x86 default execution role is create one from a policy template. Um, the role name is going to be its log uh, s3 uh, uh, read and sns publish. The policy templates, you're going to type s3, check read only. Type sns, check that. Okay. And we don't need the advanced settings down here like code signing or, or VPCs, etc. So then we create the function. It takes about, mm, I'd say, 15, 20 seconds to spin as it generates the, the roles. So there you go. Now we have a new function. Um, once that's created, then we would um, add the trigger. So let's go back to our keynote here. So we'll add a trigger. And the trigger, again, is going to be the S3 object that's incoming. Um, we're going to create a trigger based on the bucket that we created. The event is any creation event. And the prefix would be the surveys uh, prefix, um, because we only are interested in the text files that are getting uploaded. The suffix is .text. When you, do, when you set up a trigger, you have to acknowledge a recursion warning that if you put files into the bucket after you're creating them with a Lambda function and then read them into a Lambda function, you're going to cause a loop and Amazon will catch on fire and you will be, they will be very angry with you. Um, so you have to be careful. Um, but once you do that, Lambda adds the permissions necessary to go from S3 to Lambda and Lambda to SNS. Then in the code window, it's going to have a generic hello world function which you will then replace with the actual code. Um, and then we will need to edit the SNS topic ARN. This is how we publish the message to SNS. And we'll need that from the SNS topic we created earlier. So we'll go back and get that. Then we will edit the email body uh, with whatever text we like. For instance, in mine, it says, it's log, a user calls for aid. Here are the survey responses. It includes the body of the text from the file that was uploaded. And then download sysdiagnose now and then the link to the sysdiagnose file. Um, then here's the last part where you can edit the subject line, and uh, then it will send that message. Lambda's publishing to SNS via this uh, API call right here. It creates a new uh, SNS object, and then you use the publish action, or publish method, excuse me. Um, don't forget, when you add a Lambda code, you need to save your uh, code, and then also hit the deploy button. Otherwise, it will not be live. Um, and so actually, let's go back, we'll hide that, and then I'm going to get the code. Well, I'll show you the code from the other one since I don't want to go digging into my repository right now, but I'll show you this one. So here's the original function. Here's what the code source window looks like. Um, so we have the raw code here, and then here is the uh, SNS topic ARN. That came from this. If we go back to SNS, and we go to the topic. Right here, this, AR, this uh, AR Amazon resource name right here is what we put into the Lambda function. Um, we're loading a couple of libraries here. Um, and then this, uh, because it's importing the JSON event, uh, it's parsing the information from the JSON event here, the bucket, the region, the event time, the source key, which is the actual file. And uh, then it is going to replace. Here's what we do here. We take the, the incoming record about the survey, and we replace the, the key path with logs, because now we're telling this Lambda function, don't go for the text file in the surveys folder. We want the diagnostic file in the logs folder, and it's going to have this file uh, uh, extension. And then we're going to create a signed URL that is valid for seven days. Um, and then we're going to. Uh, call this um, uh, method here, S3 get signed URL. Um, and there's the parameters that it needs, the bucket, uh, the key, and then the expiration time. Um, and then we're going to decode the body of the text file that we captured. 
<clears throat> into a string, and then it's going to be inserted uh, here uh, as source body. So that's where you're going to see the raw text from the, uh, the response. And then the signed URL goes here, and then there's the S3 bucket and the file key for your information. There's the subject line and the SNS topic ARN. That's how it gets published, and then you're off. Um, so I haven't modified this. I don't need to save it or, or, or anything, but that's, that's it. And then, of course, you can see the trigger here going back to S3. And if we click this, uh, let's see, we can actually look at the configuration of that trigger here. This takes us over to the S3 bucket. And under, it should be under properties. Take a look down here under events, event notifications. There is the event that was created by the Lambda function. And all object create events, it's looking for that survey text file that invokes the Lambda function. And then the Lambda function does all the processing. All right. Now, moving on to the IAM policy. This is the security side of things. There's a few more steps for this uh, than, than we've been doing before. Policies define rights to access different services. There are two types. There's managed policies and inline policies. Uh, managed policies uh, can be applied to multiple um, uh, IAM users, and they're easier to discover. An inline policy is one that you create in the moment, ad hoc, for a single IAM user, and it can't be shared with any other user. Um, there are also AWS policies that are predefined by Amazon. The managed policies will show up as customer managed. These are the ones you create. The inline policies, again, only apply to one user, so we don't want to use that. Um, when we're creating the policy, we're going to go to the dashboard and go to policies. And then we're going to create a policy. The visual editor help walks you through exactly what uh, services you're going to uh, assign for this policy. In this case, we need S3. And you're going to click on S3 right here. And then you see this visual uh, like wizard here that shows you the actions that will be allowed for this policy and uh, the resources that they apply to. In this case, we're allowing only one permission here, put object. That's it. It doesn't need to list the bucket. It doesn't need to download the contents of the file again. It's a, basically a write-only Dropbox IAM, and that's all it needs. Um, and then the resource is going to be the specific bucket that we are uh, assigning this policy to. So you're going to click Add ARN. And in the visual editor, you're going to type the name of the bucket, forward slash, and then the prefix or the base folder where your files are. Then the resource object name is what like, types of objects or which, what names of objects you want to put in there. We're going to put an asterisk because we have to create lots and lots of them and multiple types. Uh, then you're going to uh, click Add ARNs to add this to your uh, policy. Um, at this point, you'll probably want to copy the very last line that has the ARN because we're going to need that later. And then you're going to click Next. Create a policy name and a description so other people auditing this know what it's for. Review the defined permissions in the summary, and then click Create Policy. Here's the raw policy statement. It's not much here. It just says, allow, put object on this resource. It's pretty straightforward. So uh, we will go to uh, Amazon and take a look at that. So we'll go here to Policies. And you'll see here all of the Lambda execution roles that were created earlier. We're interested in this one. We can also just search for it. So like it's log. There it is, customer managed. And there's the ARN for that policy right here. Then under permissions, we can see that it's uh, using S3. Sorry, I'll blow this up as big as I can. S3, put object. I think I'll actually hit the editor so you can see this better. All right, so there we see the, the statement. Allow, put object, and there's the resource uh, for which this policy is valid. OK. I'm going to cancel that. Then um, we need to create the IAM user. This is the, this is the account that's actually going to have the permission to write to the bucket. We're going to add a user, and we're going to give it a useful name. Uh, we are not going to give it access to the management console, because it doesn't need that. Um, you want to enter a username here, uh, then click Next. Then once you create the user, you're going to attach the policy directly to um, a policy directly to the user. So search for the policy that we just created called its log something something. 
There's no boundary that's uh, needed here unless your security policies at, at your office require it. Um, and then you're going to go to that newly minted user and start creating the access key. So I'll pause there for a second, and I'll show you creating the user. So here's the uh, username. Right? No access to the console. Attach policies directly. OK, and there's the policy that we created earlier. Check this. No boundary. Click Next. And then click Create User. OK. So uh, I don't need that user, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, delete it. Nope, sorry, mistake. Um, actually, I will, because I'll show you the process of creating the access keys. So let me go back to the Keynote slide here. We're going to go into the newly minted user, and we're going to select the Security Credentials tab. We're going to create the access key. And then this is new as of, I think, a few months ago. Amazon has a, a, a set of options here that's uh, called like best practices for, for access keys. And it's trying to suggest to you alternatives for granting access to Amazon services that don't use an access key and a secret key. But for this purpose, we are creating an app that's running outside of AWS, so we need that. Um, so go ahead and select app running outside AWS and click Next. Then once you do that, it's going to create the access key and secret key. You're only going to see it once. You have one chance to download these credentials uh, or copy them out, because once you move away from this page, they're gone, and you'll never see it again, and you'll have to destroy the uh, access key and make a new one. Seriously, you won't see it again, so you know, write it down. Um, you can save them in a CSV file. That's, that button's available to you. Most importantly, keep it secret. Keep it safe. Yes, obligatory Lord of the Rings reference here. Now, even with only write-only permissions, I strongly recommend that you at least do some minimal encoding on your access keys. Um, sometimes DLP software will flag an access key or something that it recognizes as an access key sitting out in, on a directory somewhere or in a script. So if it's encoded at least in Base64, it's less recognizable. If you choose to hash and salt your, your access keys, um, you're welcome to do that. Um, the script that I'm demonstrating you is just using Base64 so that at least it's not immediately recognizable as an Amazon credential. Um, so the script that I'm giving you expects Base64. Of course, modify it if you need to. Um, to encode those keys, we'll need to go to Terminal and run them through Base64. Um, let me stop and show you the access key creation. So we're going to go here, Security Credentials, Create an access key. Again, here's the best practices and alternatives. We are running something outside AWS. Going to click Next. Give it a description. This is um, an IAM upload only user for its log. Create access key. And then here's the page where you get to see the access key once, and you get to show the secret one time. You can hide it again if you need to. Uh, and then here's where you download the CSV file. So when you download that, um, it's pretty straightforward. It's just two fields, access key and secret key. So I will now immediately destroy that. Actions, delete. Are you sure you want to delete this? Yes, I am. You have to deactivate it first, and then you have to paste in the access key uh, uh, in to confirm that you really want to delete it. Okay. So that's that. And I'm going to delete that user since I don't need it. OK, now back to Keynote. Um, actually, that's right. I should show you that part too. So the access key and secret key that we have, I'm going to open this in Notepad or text edit. Sorry. I also work in a Windows world. Um, and then here's the here's um, where we're going to encode this. So take these in terminal, blow this up nice and big for you. So we'll copy the access key, echo quote, paste the access key, pipe base64, and there you now have it encoded in base64. And then we'll do the same thing for the secret key. Echo quote that pipe base64, and there's your secret key encoded in base64. 
So again, just minimal protection so that it's not immediately obvious that it's an Amazon key. That said, it's a write-only account, so there's pretty low risk. I mean, what's somebody gonna do? Just dump files in your bucket and they can't do anything else with it. So, um, the access keys don't expire. However, they are not a username and password. They are a key pair. So, if you lose either half of them, you have to destroy them and create a new one. You can create a maximum of two access keys per IAM user, but you can create as many IAM users as you want. Um, and of course, if you want to destroy it, this is the console, I just showed you that screen. Enter the access key, confirm deactivation, and then enter the secret key and delete it. We need one more thing to finish this. Um, we have to go back to the users page and grab the ARN for the, um, for the user that we created because we have to go to the S3 bucket and add a bucket policy. This was something that uh, I discovered uh, uh, that broke this thing when I did it the first time. Um, so when we create the bucket policy, we have to go to the permissions tab, go to edit, and then right now, if you go to this, um, this editor, there is a, a, like a modern looking wizard that helps you fill in the fields, but there's the, something missing right now for the principal, which is the IAM user that you want to act, that want to access this bucket. So um, I've had to resort to going to the policy generator. Um, now, I want to prepare you all for a time warp back to 2010, are you ready? This is the policy generator page. It was created in 2010, it has literally not changed much. I checked the internet archive, it's looked exactly the same for 13 years. So, we are going to create a S3 bucket policy. Here's what that screen looks like. Um, the effect is to allow a user to do something. The principle is going to be the um, ARN that we copied from the IAM user. The action is gonna be one action and that's put object, so it matches the IAM policy that we created earlier. And then um, the ARN, the, the resource that's allowed to write to this, uh, that the policy refers to is the, the actual uh, bucket name and key name. So um, it would look like this. It actually looks the same as the one that's in the policy. So if we go back to its log, the policy here, and we edit the policy. The resource for the uh, bucket policy is exactly this. And so if we go over to the S3 bucket, and we go over to, let's see, take a look in the bucket here, under uh, permissions. Bucket policy is right here. So it has an allow statement. Here's the principle of the, um, the write only um, uh, user, and then here is the resource that corresponds to um, the bucket and the path within that bucket where we're allowed to work on files. Um, right, let's go back here. Then you add the statement in this wizard, and then it's gonna show you a summary of the statement you just uh, crafted. Then you're gonna click generate policy. It'll now show you the JSON equivalent of that policy, and then you're gonna copy it out to a text editor or copy it into another tab into the S3 bucket policy. We're going to come back to 2023 where everything is nice and clean and shiny um, and we're going to paste it there into the bucket policy section. Then we'll save our changes and now we have granted the IAM user the ability to accept a file and then be able to put it in the bucket and the bucket says I will allow this IAM user to store files uh, in me. So here we go. Now uh, the tool that we're going to be using for the end user interaction portion is Swift Dialog. Um, you've probably heard a lot about Swift Dialog if you've been doing any kind of Mac administration. If you haven't, this is an awesome tool for end user interactions. It's endlessly customizable. You can also update the contents of Swift Dialog live while running. Um, Dep Notify used to do something similar to this where you would write commands to a log file and it would pick up those changes and refresh the contents of the window. Um, it can replace a lot of tools you may already have been using like Cocoa Dialog, Pashua, it even has a Jamf helper syntax if you want to just do a drop-in replacement. And uh, it's 100% Swift, so it only works on Mac OS 11 and higher. And a uh, gentleman from Australia, Bart Reardon, wrote this tool. Um, it's a fantastic tool. There's his GitHub repo. Here's just um, a couple of screenshots that you can see of what it kind of looks like. This is a really basic demo window. It supports SF symbols with different colors. Uh, it supports markdown, you can do font sizes and colors, checkboxes, picture galleries, videos, 
You can do complex forms like this with a, with a progress bar and a button and, or multiple buttons. Um, and then something like this with you know, lots of text and a field and required fields, drop downs, et cetera. Then the, the script itself, this is like the meat and potatoes of its log. Uh, it is written in bash and uses only uh, curl and any other built-in. So we don't rely on the Amazon command line utility or Python. Um, I built this with the intention of being able to deploy it to any Mac without having to install anything else or manage the distribution of these tools. Um, so that was my design goal here. Um, it uses the Amazon version 4 security policy. Uh, it's HIDEC complex. I don't pretend to understand how that policy works, but I found code online that, that Rich Troughton had shared a few years ago about doing something similar to this. And the script he found was something from 2015. It works great, um, and, and it's, it's easy enough to read. I just don't understand it's a, Amazon's policy is quite complex. The script itself will take seven arguments. Um, if you're a Jamf customer, you already probably ignore one, two, and three anyway, because those are just default dummy values that Jamf sends over, like the computer name and the current user. Um, but number four, parameter number four is the access key. Number five is the secret key. Uh, and this would be uh, encoded, so it's expecting you to supply base64 values, not the actual keys. Uh, number six is the bucket at region. It has to be written this way, so bucket name at the region name. Um, and then number seven is an optional parameter called customer. Um, this is based on a conversation I had literally last night with uh, somebody who works at an MSP uh, who said it would be cool to have this uh, to uh, deploy to multiple customers uh, and then have all of my diagnostic logs organized by, by customer. Um, again, you don't need that, and if you don't enter a value there, it'll put NA or not applicable. The buckets may require the URL in this format, bucket.s3.region.amazonaws.com. I have an older bucket that I set up for this that doesn't, but some of the new ones will, if you try to use the base URL, it'll uh, kick back with a temporary redirect or 302 error, and it'll tell you in the, the output that you need to use the URL in this format. Um, the script is designed to monitor the progress of uploading the sysdiagnose file with curl, and it will also contain settings for branding Swift dialog. Uh, you will want to include assets here for adding your company logo, any other graphics for, for the users, and maybe some fun sound effects. Um, you can also add additional logs and other files into the archive uh, before it compresses. Um, normally, sysdiagnose will generate a, a tarball or tar.gz file, but it, you can run it with a modified parameter to not create the archive and just leave it a folder for you with all the contents. At that point, you can add in anything else you want in that folder before you tarball it yourself and then package it. Um, the script dialog will display a miniature window after the user has filled out the survey and they click OK. It will show them the progress of that upload until it's done. And um, the assets that you may need for this would include the application icon for its log. Um, that's mostly for self-service, but if you want to use it for something internally, that's fine. Um, I have a, an icon in the app that's the sad Mac crashing because it, you know something went wrong. Um, you may want to use a company logo if you like, optional sound effects. Um, then you have a decision to make when you're deploying this tool. Um, there is a beautiful poem that starts with this line, I'm sure you all know this, Two Roads Diverged in the Yellow Wood um, by uh, Robert Frost. And for us, we have uh, two choices here. Are we going to deploy this in Jamf, or are we a non-Jamf shop and we have to use some open source tools to deploy this? So I'll show you briefly what the Jamf setup looks like. You're going to have a policy with one script, and um, it's a self-service policy, so no other triggers except uh, custom if you want it, otherwise you don't need triggers. And then you need to have a script in there. Uh, because it's a self-service item, you will um, want to have an icon that users recognize and put it in a category uh, that they'll, sorry, that they will um, know where to find it, like a self-help category. Uh, the policy itself, you'll have a script object, and you'll need the four uh, script parameters for access key, secret key, the bucket at region, and then the customer field. Again, those are base64, so make sure you paste them in accordingly. Uh, the screenshot's wrong. Those are not base64. I just kind of fudged and, and made up fake uh, credentials there, but do use base64 for this. Um, then, if you're going to go the open source route, you might need this if you have uh, an MDM that doesn't offer a software catalog like self-service. Uh, if you have an MDM that can't run certain arbitrary scripts, 
Uh, you are a, an MSP with certain boutique deployments and you want to customize this for your customers. Uh, or you want to use a menu bar support tool um, that the user clicks and, and gets quick access to help. One that I just found out about recently that apparently some people are using here is support app from Route 3. And it's a menu bar support tool that's built 100% in Swift, and it contains a whole bunch of handy-dandy buttons with statistics about your computer. Um, the buttons can be programmed to open system settings. They can launch websites. They can launch other apps. They can also run scripts, which is really effective. Swift UI and SF symbols are used heavily in here. It has a dark mode. You can add your own icons and custom branding. Settings for this are deployed via configuration profile. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then if you are a Jamf customer, you can uh, plug in their Jamf custom schema. It makes it a lot easier to configure. Um, and then if you have Jamf, you can also plug in profile variables, like dollar sign computer, or dollar sign username, or dollar sign extension attribute underscore 125, whatever that value might be if you're using it for something special in your shop. It crucially includes something new in a recent release that's a, called support helper, and it's a, it's a tool that allows you to run with elevated privileges. So this is vitally important for this script because sysdiagnose requires root access to run in order to generate and collect logs all over the system. It is free and it's available at github slash root3nl. So um, I want to demonstrate this for you now Before we go to final thoughts, so I've got the run book out of the way. I've got my email up. And then I'm going to click up here on the support tool. All right, so we've got that. Click on the support tool. And then click on its log. OK, oh no, something went wrong. Um, I, am, uh, I was using Premiere. And my system crashed uh, when opening a project. Um, this happens um, when um, you know loading files from uh, the um, the server. I mean, a user's probably not going to necessarily know all this detail, but we'll try. How off? What type of issue is this? This was a system crash, um, and. Uh, how often, how frequently is it occurring? Uh, it varies. When did it last occur? Less than 20 minutes ago. Um, and so right now it's gathering logs. Now this takes a, a minute or two because again it's a sys diagnose and they typically take about two or three minutes on average. Um, but it will keep the user apprised of the progress as it's collecting these logs. Um, and then so uh, we will just wait here a second while it finishes up. Um, I wanted to know if you guys had any questions at this point uh, while this finishes up. Yes. Whoa. Sorry. <laughs> so once, oh man, it's loud. Yeah. So um, once the log gets collected, you, the window closes automatically, right? But yes, what if you're in a previous window, the user hasn't typed in all the details yet? Will it still close, or will it wait till you press OK to close the window if the uh, log's already So clicked? that's a good question. If they are just like taking too long or they forget to, to click OK, um, it still will have uploaded the diagnostic log in the background. So you'll at least have the log and a record that something happened. Um, if they never fill in something in the survey, uh, it will upload a blank file uh, that, that the user did not enter any information. Um, and then at that point, you, the tool will still go and reference the original log file that was uploaded. Um, and again, because the, and I'll show you the file structure in a second of what, what it ends up uploading. But there's the file name that's in a specific format that has the computer name, the time of date, um, all that jazz in it. And then um, the, the log file is, ends in .tar.gz and the survey file ends in .text and they're both in separate uh, folders on the S3 bucket. So the Lambda function looks at the name of the text file and then goes to the logs folder and uh, grabs the, uh, the .tar.gz to generate the pre-signed URL. OK, so it's compressing the log right now and preparing to upload. Um, so yeah, if they just forget about the window, they walk away after the crash, they just want to get the logs out, that's fine. It'll, you'll still get a record that they did something. Um, any, did I answer that question for you? Yeah. OK, cool. Any other questions while it's up? Uh, oh, there it goes. See, it's uploading. 
and get, thank goodness for fast internet. Okay, so the file was just uploaded, and then this window will close automatically in a few seconds. And then once that closes, uh, the Lambda function, uh, it's gonna upload the survey, and then the survey file will trigger the Lambda function to generate the email. So I should get that momentarily. This, might, this normally takes about 20 to 30 seconds for the email to come through on average. I have a mail rule set up to filter these to, my, uh, to a subfolder. Uh, if it doesn't, I'll go to Gmail and get it, but uh, certainly this, uh, I wanted you to show you the format of the message. In fact, while that's coming in, we can see one here. User called for aid. Uh, I had the customer field uh, populated in the uh, previous one as Green Feathers Incorporated. There's the serial number, who was logged in, what's the Mac model, what version of Mac OS, and then here was their response. Um, and then here's the pre-signed URL to download the sysdiagnose. All right, here's the one that actually came in, the, the newest one. So here we go. Oh no, something went wrong, yada yada. Here's my user ID, here's the tel description of what happened, and then download the sysdiagnose file now. So we click that, and then it opens over here in Safari, and there it is, it's downloading. So there's your tarball uh, that's about 320 megs, and so you will need that uh, to send to Apple or to do your own analysis of whatever you know, suits your fancy. Um, the, the critical component here, I think, is the notifications, so that when your users run this, you'll know that something's happened and that that's your uh, way of, of um, you know, being alerted to a, a serious problem. All right. Um, that went much better than uh, the last time I did this. So, um, <laughs> um, so I just have some, uh, some final thoughts about this. Um, so its log is, is pretty flexible. Uh, because it's using Swift Dialog, you can customize all of the branding and the user input form. If you don't like what I wrote, you can you know, design it how you want. If you want to add additional questions in the drop downs, you can certainly do that um, or even strip it down. The uh, file names for the sysdiagnose are in a format that's pretty close to what Apple uses right now, um, and it doesn't contain any spaces in it. It's all, uh, you know, alphabetic, uh, alphanumerics and underscores uh, just, and dashes, I think, just to keep things, uh, you know, compatible in the URLs. You can add additional logs in there if you want. Um, optionally, use a customer field to, um, organize uh, these from different customers and keep them separated. I did promise you I would show you that. So back in the S3 bucket, we can actually examine the contents directly here. So go to its log blamo2. And I'm sorry, Amazon is a little bit funky when it comes to uh, these things. But down here, we've got logs and surveys. So this is the, the two folders that were created. If we go into logs, uh, there's the one for Green Feathers Inc. I mean, you can see that. I'm sorry. Green Feathers Inc. And if we go in there, there's the serial number of the computer that just uploaded a log. And then there's the sysdiagnose log that was just uploaded uh, right now at uh, uh, UTC, is it the 19th? What time is it? That's the most recent one, I think. Yeah, so, uh, oh yeah, 1609, there we go. So that's it. That's the file that we just uploaded. And then over in the, uh, the survey, folder, surveys, green feathers ink, serial number, and there's the corresponding text file. So the file name only differs by the file extension, and so that's why the Lambda function can just translate that over and grab the, uh, the, the tarball and then create a, um, a signed URL for you. So um, this is ideal for people who have an OS support agreement with Apple, but you can use it for really anything if you're even curious about uh, system crashes, if you want to run it on your own system to diagnose a recent issue, you want to just dive into sysdiagnose files and learn about how they work and what's in them. Um, its log is mostly about clearing the support bottleneck so that they're not waiting for you, but that you can have the user bring that information to you much faster. It's about getting the user story and the data together at the same time as quickly as possible because on a Mac, the logs start rolling off over a period of time, and you want it, and the longer you wait, the less likely it is you'll have the information you need. Um, and in Apple Care support agreement, you have a number of people that can create cases, they're called technical contacts, and those people will be submitting these diagnostic logs with the user story to Apple and, and have their level three engineers work on them. And when you submit a sysdiagnose and a story together, that gets you faster turnaround with Apple because they already know what to look for especially with the timestamps on the users providing those. 
um, that, you know, that you could say this happened an hour ago and this is happening every week or so, something like that. Um, for me, this was a learning experience because I've done this presentation before, as some of you might have, have found out. Um, I did it at Jano 22 in San Diego. The rehearsal for me went fine. I did a live build just like I did now, and I had plenty of time to spare. But when I actually ran the app, it, it didn't run. And I was kind of bummed, obviously. So I just switched to uh, a pre-recorded demo and played that, and it did what I wanted it to do. Um, in hindsight, I should have had a backup environment with you know, like separate keys that I knew were going to work, and I could have swapped those out. Um, but again, a learning experience. Um, I found out that the IAM policy was incomplete. I think I was missing a, a slash somewhere. And then I also had forgotten the S3 bucket policy. I do not even remember creating the bucket policy when I was testing this, but apparently that was needed, and I didn't have that at the time. Um, so I reviewed all of my code, and I made some improvements and increased the security. The pre-signed URL was also something I really wanted to do uh, to make that more convenient uh, and to also take the bucket private as opposed to leaving it public. Um, I had also recently encountered a fatal issue with curl when I switched this from bash to Z shell as the interpreter, and it took me a bit to figure out why. Uh, but it kept saying that it was missing some parameters, and I was you know, reading the output of the script. I, I enabled verbose mode in curl. I even used set-x in the script, which tells you literally every command that's running. It's, it's a lot more information than you might need, but it helps you with potentially debugging uh, scripts. And then I started talking through the problem out loud on Slack. I think this was late Saturday evening. I was kind of dumping my thoughts and ideas into the channel, and I wasn't getting any responses, but I just sort of, sometimes it helps me to talk through problems. And, and, and then, um, you know, after a bunch of hours of working on this, I, I kind of had a eureka moment uh, where I figured out exactly what was wrong. And it was that um, the, it was the single quote versus double quote issue in Z shell, which, yeah, I see some heads nodding that, that, that's bitten you a few times. Um, and I compared it by running it with SH as a shell interpreter and it, the output looks completely different. Um, it was that there was some variable substitution for a much longer string in curl that was being simplified to a single argument. But all I had to do to change that was add each of those like four arguments to the curl command, and then it was fine. But it took me a while to figure that out. Um, and when I did find that out, I, I started like a stream of consciousness explaining this on Slack that, wh what the heck was that? <laughs> did you guys see, wh wh what was that? <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, thank you, thank you, King Arthur. Um, yeah, so someone on the channel uh, explained helpfully to me that what I did was called rubber duck debugging. How many of you have heard of this concept before? Okay, good, um, I'm, I'm in comp good company now. I literally never heard of this before. Um, and I thought the rubber duck was some kind of like mockery or a joke or whatever. And um, rubber duck debugging is all about explaining your code to someone. Um, and I brought a bunch of tiny little rubber ducks to kind of illustrate here. Um, they're excellent listeners because they just patiently sit there and listen to you talk your code through. Um, the solution will often reveal itself as you are debugging. And doing this method kind of helps your, your critical thinking skills, problem solving, and, and will deepen your understanding about your own software. Um, so this concept came from a book that was published a little over 20 years ago called The Programmatic Programmer, written by David Thomas and Andrew Hunt. And it's a collection of short topics, concepts, and pro tips and anecdotes for software developers of all uh, stripes and all uh, experience levels. It's not specific to any programming language or SDK, although in the original publication they covered like C and, and Java and, and COBOL. Um, they've updated it to, you know, maybe remove some of those older references, but the basic concepts haven't changed. And the idea is that it contains a lot of sound, practical advice for programmers of, of, of you know, whatever your experience level. Um, the specific story about rubber duck debugging comes uh, from page 94, and it's actually referenced several times in the book. And it says, a very simple but particularly effective technique for finding the cause of a problem is to explain it to someone else. The person should look over your shoulder at the screen and nod his or her head constantly like a rubber duck bobbing up and down in the bathtub. They do not need to say a word. The simple act of explaining step by step what the code is supposed to do uh, often causes the problem to leap off the screen and announce itself. It sounds simple, but in explaining the problem to another person, you must explicitly state things that you take for granted and when going through the code yourself. And by having to verbalize these assumptions, you may suddenly gain new insight into the problem. If you don't have a person or a rubber duck, you can also use a teddy bear, potted plant, or something else. 
And the reason that he brought up this anecdote is he said, as an undergraduate at Imperial College in London, uh, Dave, the author, did a lot of work with a research assistant named Greg Pugh, one of the best developers Dave has ever known. For several months, Greg carried around a small yellow rubber duck which he would place on his terminal while coding. And it was a while before Dave had the courage to ask him, what the hell is up with that rubber duck? And that's when he explained it to him. So rubber duck debugging, uh, it might help you too. So uh, go duck yourselves. Uh, we've got little rubber ducks to hand out. Everybody can get one and uh, please take a rubber ducky with you. I uh, hope that this will uh, uh, be interesting for you and you can use the rubber duck to uh, talk through your problems. Uh, resources for this presentation are all here. Uh, the original script, uh, the original post from uh, Richard uh, Troughton is there, Rich Troughton. Uh, Swift Dialog. Uh, uh, that, I'm sorry, that link, uh, the its log repo that's listed there is old, I will get rid of that. The support app, <laughs> oh my god, heads up. I wanted to uh, acknowledge a few people that were helpful in this. Uh, lots of people on Slack that I talked to that uh, were, uh, you know, just like sounding boards, uh, gave me some advice and pointers and places to go. Um, three very helpful gentlemen from Amazon, Bryson Terrell, Dave Cedar, and Scott Blake. Again, were just like good sounding boards and just listened to me and gave me some practical advice and directions to go. Um, and of course, Millie, I could not have done this without you. Or you were extremely patient and um, you know, uh, just like, sat with me while I rehearsed this and updated this and edited it and revised it and drove myself crazy trying to put this together. Um, so thank you, honey. And, um, and of course, um, our cat, Pumpkin. Um, sadly, I'd forgotten to put pictures of Pumpkin in here, so I, don't get, I have to pay the cat tax at some point. Um, but uh, thank you very much for listening, and uh, uh, that is its log. Do we have any other questions from the crowd? So you guys all know how to build this now, great. Yes. Sorry, uh, do we have the little yellow box somewhere? Oh, sorry. I'm um, just curious generally, like how, in an organization with 6,000 endpoints, how often do you get reports in? Because like we're much smaller than that, and I think it's a cool tool, but I wonder like how it would scale for us down. So how it would scale down? Um, I mean, just like in terms of like, what do you get in like one week, right? Um, it, it depends. Um, so sometimes we might go a couple of weeks and not get any. Um, yeah. And then uh, when the TV show that was using this the most was in production, they were invoking this at least a couple times a week when they had you know, crashes or whatever. Um, the, the thing about this is because it's so inexpensive to run that you, know, you could just stand this up and, and the business won't even like, notice the cost at all. It's, it's not a lot of space, it's not a frequently running function, um, and it scales up or down to any size really because you know, let's say you don't use the tool for a month and then something comes up and you need it, it's still there. Um, the only thing is that if you set the lifecycle policy, the files go away, but that's it. So, yeah, you can use it in an organization of any size. Yep, cool. Yep. Question in the back? <laughs> do you mind, pass, do you mind, do you mind uh, passing that back? Is this a tool that we could use to submit sysdiagnose logs to Apple Seed feedback assistant? Uh, so if you guys know about Apple, so the question is about Appleseed uh, and using the feedback assistant, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, if you collected one of these from an end user and you want to start filing feedback in addition to your support case, you can do that. Um, just open feedback and then when you're filling it out, feedback assistant normally starts generating one for you so you have to wait for it to stop and then delete the one that it puts in because it's not, the feedback is not about your computer, it's about somebody else's. So you have to wait for, assist, uh, for feedback assistant to finish generating the sysdiagnose from your machine, then delete it, and then you know, put the other one in that you intend and then tell Apple what's going on. But this is not my computer, this is someone else's. Um, also, feedback assistant will add the system profiler information from your machine in there. You'll need to delete that too, otherwise they might get confused. Just make it really clear that this is not from this machine, but a different machine. Um, and that's helpful too if you have an ongoing feedback where Apple actually replies in the rare instance that they do reply and say we need more information, then you can keep giving them cystiagnosis. Thank you, that's a good question. Any others? Yes, uh, we have one down in front here. So 
So um, upside down. Thank you. Uh, so we have our own like internal ticketing system. You know, is there was there a rationale why maybe you jumped past that and just went straight to a downloadable link, or do you ever think about integrating it into an internal ticketing system while you're at it? Uh, yeah, so you're talking about integrating it into something like ServiceNow, for instance? Yeah, or, or Jira, uh, or yeah, yeah, whatever. So um, yeah, if you wanted to integrate that, that would be something you could uh, extend the script with. Uh, I would say probably the best way to do that would be to uh, you know, create a, lab a Lambda function of sorts yeah. to read the same data and then fire off an event to your ticketing system. Yeah. So then you'd have to craft uh, the parameters that you need uh, in that Lambda function to, to generate the ticket. That said, I would caution you against using that for like everyday tickets, right. because it's going to take the user a few minutes to write out what happened and then upload the file. Um, you can use it for this if you really want to use it for all kinds of tickets, but it no. depends. Yeah, you're shaking your head no, I wouldn't either. That's why I said, at stress, this is something you want to set expectations for, that it's for serious crashes, repeatable bugs, kernel panics, things of that nature that are like, hold on, this person is literally not able to work anymore and maybe this is happening more than once uh, you know, in a short period of time, um, or if they do the same thing over and over. And I would also say it might be a good idea to work, if it's a piece of software from a third party vendor that is having a problem, you might want to open a case with AppleCare and with the vendor at the same time and give each other both case numbers and give the sysdiagnose to the vendor as well because then they can analyze it and see if they can figure out what's wrong. Because the sysdiagnose will contain crashes and spins, including all the recent applications that died. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. What about bringing this to iOS for custom app development? Ooh, iOS. Um, so the only way that I know of to generate a sysdiagnose on, an I, on iOS is to squeeze the, the three buttons together and like wait a second. Um, if there is another method to generate sysdiagnose logs on an iOS device, you probably have to write an you app can, about it. You can do, because uh, I was having a conversation about the Apple test, where sysdiagnose comes up a lot on the iOS stuff. There's a way to do it using accessibility, mm. uh, where I think it's if you program like what is it like triple tap the back of your phone, it'll run it or something like that. So mm. you can you can actually invoke it in other methods, yeah. Using the accessibility method, is that something the user would have to configure or can you manage that with a config profile? Uh, dude, I don't know. <laughs> no, okay. no, it's, a, it's a legit, it's just, just, I was curious yeah, because I, I, know. I know what you're talking about, the, the custom like triggers and the accessibility settings, but um, I generally think that Apple doesn't manage accessibility settings, so they try not to, so I think you would have to configure that on the device and then teach users how to do it. Well, I was talking about in just iOS in general, right? Because if you're going to do custom apps and you're going to deploy those, you want to be able to catch that sysdiagnose from iOS, so it's the same, the back half of this is the same, it's just a matter of capturing that information yeah. and kicking it off. Yeah, that's tricky because it's, it's probably more of a sandboxing issue and the sysdiagnose file lives outside of your app, and so if you're going to generate one, your app would have had to um, have the rights to read that file in the first place. I don't know if it does, but the way that Apple wants you to collect sysdiagnosis is like plug it into a computer and then uh, grab it from through the finder sync or have two devices signed into iCloud at the same time, I think. <laughs> Ironically, on the test, it says you have to either sync or you have to use AirDrop, even though there's like a thousand different options in the share button. And you might be running on a company device that restricts AirDrop. Exactly. So then you have to figure out another way. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. It would be, it would be nice for... for Challenge know, to have it done by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Anything else? We got one minute. Oh, I just want to mention that is a static uh, QR code. No funky trackers or redirectors. I actually had to work to find one because most of the other ones were meant for marketing purposes and uh, I didn't want that. So, anything else? Okay. Well, thanks again for coming. Appreciate it.